Thank you so much. For it, it is a great <laughs> pleasure. A great here. pleasure. Okay, how many years have you been fighting 20, for this? Oh, I've fighting for this since I was 19 years old. Really? So whatever that is, 30 years. Uh, I started when I was an undergraduate. Uh, I founded the Oxford Campaign for an Independent Britain in 1990. So it's been a very long time coming. Mm -hmm. And you haven't changed your mind? Or you haven't had any single doubt during this journey or anything? No, I mean, and, but to be clear, what I wanted all the way through was some different deal, you know, that if, so what, what, what radicalized me as a student was Maastricht. Up until then, you could mm -hmm. still argue that the EU was primarily economic, it was a club of nations, cooperating, doing together what they couldn't do on their own. Mm -hmm. Nobody had a problem with that. But Maastricht extended its jurisdiction into everything, foreign affairs, citizenship, criminal justice, you know, a whole bunch of things that were nothing to do with trade or economics. And from then on, I took the position, as a lot of British Eurosceptics did, that we needed to get back to a sort of economics-only deal, common market, not common government. And if we couldn't persuade the rest of the EU to do that, then we should get a special status. And it's worth just asking this. Why, even with a referendum hanging over them, were the EU leaders not prepared to countenance such a thing? I mean, if, if David Cameron had come back in 2016 with any recovery of power, who can doubt that he would have won and that Brexit wouldn't have happened? Mm. But the EU was readier to lose its second financial contributor than to allow any precedent of power being returned from Brussels to the national level. And that's something that Remainers on both sides of the channel, I think, have never really faced up to. The EU is, is not a fixed uh, dispensation. It's an evolving dynamic and it's heading in a direction that we didn't want to follow. How would you define conservatism today? Today. Well, I, I think probably in terms very similar to what Edmund Burke did when he invented it. You know, a conservative is someone who wants to ensure that tried and trusted institutions are not lost in what can be passing revolutionary spasms. Uh, we prefer the evolved, the natural, the organic to the rational, the planned and the imposed. And we see it as our role to apply the brakes, to ensure that uh, social and governmental changes don't get too far ahead of public opinion. Uh, Roger Scruton, greatest conservative thinker of our time who died recently, told me when I was a, a teenager, uh, a conservative thinker is there to reassure the people that their prejudices are true. Now, of course, <laughs> these days prejudice means something like being nasty to minorities or something, but, but he was using the word in its correct and exact sense to mean you prejudge a new situation on the basis of past experience. He, he understood that life would be impossible if every time you encountered something new, you tried to think it through from first principles without drawing on uh, what Edmund Burke called the wisdom of our ancestors. And, and I think that's a pretty good definition of conservatism. Mm. And what we see in the Western world today is this huge um, polarization and so on. So how do we close that gap and what is the way forward? I mean, we have a, 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 a culture war which may not be unprecedented. It seems new because we didn't have it in the late 20th century. But actually, if you go back further, you can find equally polarized societies. Uh, and it's, it's fundamentally about values. And uh, I think, you know, it takes different forms. In the US, it's focused on Trump. In Britain, it's focused on, on Brexit. The best thing you can do is to show the other side that their fears were misplaced. So in the case of Brexit, I think the best thing we can do is leave the European Union in an internationalist, moderate, global spirit, so as to convince the 48% that they were worried unnecessarily. Now, not all of them will be convinced, but enough of them will that we can uh, have a, a measure of calm compared to what we had in the last three years. So what do you think of Brexit? Will, which problem will it solve first? I think there are two big advantages. First, we can trade more with the bits of the world that are growing, which is to say everywhere except Europe. Uh, and second, having got power back from the EU, we can push it downwards and outwards to local authorities or better yet to individual citizens. In other words, we can use it as a moment of, of democratic renewal. And with Boris and his team in charge, I'm more optimistic than I've been at any point in my lifetime about politics. One last question. 
as a new MVP, do you have an advice for me? Never <laughs> ever forget that you are here to represent Sweden in Brussels rather than to represent Brussels in Sweden. And that may sound such an obvious point, but how many people have I seen who arrive more or less as critical and who end up drifting with the consensus? I'm sure you guys won't. Uh, but never ever forget the, 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 the people are the boss and that this is a, a transient passing moment in your life. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to meet you. Thank you.